Hello, my friends, and welcome to Quartet. So nice to have you with us today. I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute, and we're coming to you from our little resort town in the Appalachian Mountains, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, like we do every two weeks. And we're happy to talk today about the Mandela effect. So I hope you'll stay tuned. You're going to enjoy this one. I'm joined, as I always am, by my good friends, uh, Greg Brayden. Hello, Greg. How are you, sir? John and Kingsley and Penny, it's good to see you. I'm doing well. I'm coming to you from our Santa Fe studio where it's still winter here. Uh, it's spring. Spring <laughs> on, is arrived. on the first day of spring. <laughs> yeah, the spring has arrived officially and uh, literally here. It's uh, really uh, daffodils are out and we're getting wow. there. Um, Penny Kelly, how are you? Hi, guys. I'm great. I'm glad to be here. I was sorry to miss last week. And yes, we are having snowflakes. So spring is only an illusion at this point. <laughs> and Kingsley, how are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you, John. And uh, I'm good to be here from my uh, private bunker somewhere in the United Kingdom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Unstated location, right? Good. I'm glad. Uh, we're happy that you're safe. Uh, so our topic today is uh, has to do with the Mandela effect. And I mean, this is, uh, uh, I'll be interested to see how we all come up with the, what what is happening, because for the most part, everybody just tells stories. And so I'll, I'll start with a story, I guess, uh, so that we can kind of set the stage. There's this uh, one book that I was listening to as I was driving across the country last summer. Uh, and, you know, one one ship was chasing the other one and they were shooting at each other. And uh, uh, as it turns out, uh, that there are two cannons uh, on most of those ships uh, pointing forward and, the, and on, on the stern pointing aft. And those are called chasers. And their whole purpose was to allow as you were moving, you know, right behind another ship to be able to shoot at the ship rather than a broadside. Okay, so they're heading down toward Australia, down in the, the Indian Ocean, in the middle of an extraordinary storm. And uh, the Dutch ship is gaining and gaining on the British ship and, you know, and then the stress and the energy is all at a huge kind of increase. And they're into the storm surge with these big rollers, these giant waves to where that at one time, one ship would be at the top of the wave and the other one at the trough. And then they did alternate and they could only shoot while they were passing through the kind of the sight line uh, as one was going up above or below. And so it was a, an extraordinary uh, kind of uh, action uh, scene, and it was uh, uh, explained by the fact that in these kinds of situations that the uh, both ships would push themselves exactly to the limit. They would run up as much canvas as possible. They would trim it all in so tight. So just so that they could get the last quarter knot out of out of the wind. Well, they went through a de description of the physics of how that worked and how that everything was all just all right at the exact edge and just pushing in any kind of change to that. And particularly if it was a catastrophic change, if you hit a, hit a spar and it fell over, then suddenly... What was all in balance, just pushing it, would suddenly rapidly become out of balance and the thing would suddenly become just um, uh, a subject to the extraordinary winds and the sails and everything would be over. And it went through this description of the physics of how this all worked. Well, I'm an engineer. I like that. I remember that. And so I enjoyed that kind of episode so much that uh, back in December, then I decided where I was driving. I can't remember where Florida, I guess it was. 
And I decided I'd listen to that again. And I listened to it again. And it went right through the middle of that episode and it didn't have the description of all the physics of how this thing was all wired up and all spring loaded to come apart at a moment's notice if the if the forces change. And I couldn't believe it. I ran down and I read it, watch it, listen to it again. And then I said, God, I got to. So I bought the book to find out if the book really married. And it's not there. It's not there. And I couldn't believe that it wasn't there because I remember how it described how this all worked. And I didn't make that up in my mind as I was driving through Kansas, let me tell you. And so it 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 um, it impressed me, you know, and so I immediately went back to the Matrix movie and the cat uh, scene where it duplicates, duplicates the cat walking by and you say there's a glitch in the Matrix or something going on here. But it became very, very real to me in that uh, experience. And so um, many others, and I'm sure that some of you will have a chance to uh, tell us a story or two about your experiences. But the, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that these kinds of uh, anecdotes abound. And so the question for today is, what in the world is this about? And, and more importantly, so what really is happening? There's an underlying, there's a message in here for us, it seems to me. Uh, some kind of a gleam of light that uh, illuminates uh, what this reality is about or where we're going or something. And so I'd like for you all to take a shot at it and uh, tell me what you think. And so let's start with you, Penny. What do you think? Okay, so um, let me just kind of lay out a couple of things. So let's just put out the two words, objectivity and subjectivity. Okay, just put those in your mind, but over to the side. So then if we go to science, which has always had the last word in what's real and what's not real. Um, science has made this assumption and the assumption is that there's something called strong objectivity. And what that means is that there's an independent world out there that exists totally separate and independently from us. It's an objective thing. It's real. They don't say anything about subjectivity. Just, you know, subjectivity is irrelevant. But this strong objectivity has this assumption that underlies all of their investigations. So that worked for a long time <clears throat> until along comes um, like Walt, uh, was it Walter Heisenberg, I think was his name, Heisenberg and his quantum theory and his uncertainty principle. And what did he say? You know, there's this, um, there's, the, he first he said, well, matter is not just this hard stuff. It's it's a particle and it's a wave. It's dual. So at that point, people were ah blah blah. blah. And he said, and furthermore, you can't know the position of that particle and the speed both at the same time, because if you know the position, it affects the speed, and the speed you can't know it. It you can't pin it down, and vice versa. If you track the speed then you lose track of the particle. <laughs> so and what he said was when you observe the that wave, it collapses. So the so that then created a big stir and and that brought up this whole then issue with Schrodinger's cat, <laughs> who said if you put a cat in a box with a little bit of radiation, you don't know if the cat is dead or alive. So the cat literally is existing in your consciousness in all states of being, dead and alive. It's not until you open the box and observe that you actually know 
whether the cat is dead or alive. And so they use that principle of the collapse of the wave and the cat being in all states. And they came up with superposition, which basically says that things exist in all possible states until you observe. So when you, when you look at what they're saying, what they're actually saying, and, and you read into the, into some of the science, what they um, indicate is that this, the whole reality are these waves and they're all interacting with one another in a kind of kaleidoscopic fashion. So I have been at a level of consciousness watching that kaleidoscopic action. And I have to say, there are very few words that can describe how beautiful that is, how amazing, how engaging that is. And, and so, so if we look at the assumption we started with, which is there's an independent reality out there and we have, um, it has nothing to do with us. It lives and exists without us. And then along comes these guys saying, it's a wave and a particle and the wave collapses when you look at it why it's because there are these rays these laser blue lasers that come out of the eyeballs and where they converge is where reality actually takes shape you can pull anything out of the soup because those lasers are observing the soup and when you look at that soup it begins to take shape according to the intent the desires the will, the attitude it, that have been preloaded into those lasers and you get reality. So the bottom line is that you end up realizing that, okay, this assumption of objectivity, um, strong objectivity isn't valid. We have a tremendous impact on our reality. So my own personal theory after having watched that kaleidoscopic action is that everybody is having an impact on that whole reality and all those waves. And it's constantly shifting and moving in the most beautiful of ways. Every thought you have, every word you speak, every action that you do ends up impacting that reality and and the whole thing the is big the whole cosmos responds to us as individual individuals so if you go now to the mandela effect and say how how did you know how did the berenstein bears become the berenstein bears i used to read the the story to my kids when they were little little bitty kids and it was s t e i n and and I remember Stouffer's uh, stovetop stuffing. It wasn't craft stovetop stuffing and, and a whole bunch of other things. So you can chalk that up to um, marketing or logo changes if you want, but there are other things that I have experienced. People come into a room and they say, oh, I thought this was over here and that was over there. I just experienced that with my son two days ago looking at houses and and so his memory is that the the whole house was flipped why does that happen that is a signal that we have or someone whoever's doing the observing has moved into an alternate reality we have 10,000 versions of ourselves and we construct those selves to be able to manage everything that comes at us and so when you have the great preponderance of people who, um, who's, who think that the Berenstain Bears was or is Berenstain Bears, that actually shifts the reality. And bottom line is the Mandela effect is leading us to understand that we are intimately involved in the reality, intimately. It is, we are creating as we go along and the whole thing is incredibly fluid. It's not the objective, strong objective reality system that we thought we had. 
in fact, opens the door to a whole new kind of science and the development of new people, new humans. Uh, I'm listening, John. What I'm realizing is if we have new people tuning in, we didn't really clearly define what the Mandela effect is. So just for someone who, who may just be tuning in and maybe not familiar with, with the term, uh, it, it was coined when it was discovered that there was a, a large contingent of the population that believed and in their memory, uh, they saw Nelson Mandela had died while he was imprisoned in South Africa. Uh, but the textbooks and Wikipedia will say that he was released from prison and went on to become the president of his nation and lived many years and, and died after that. Uh, two very different realities, very different memories for each contingent, <clears throat> very, very real. And, and that's where the name comes from, the Mandela effect. Well, I, uh, I've been following this closely for years. And there are so many documented instances. Uh, Penny just talked about the, the Bernstein, the Bernstein bears. I personally remember when I was a kid, I wore Fruit of the Loom underwear. That was very popular back in the 60s. And the logo had a cornucopia that the company says never existed. If you Google it now, they'll say that never existed. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't keep my underwear, so I can't. <laughs> I can't look at them today. I also very clearly remember the uh, Snow White mirror, mirror on the wall was the way that it was in the film that I saw. We used to say it to one another all the time. And what the Disney and what the, the textbooks will say now is that those words were never used, that the words became magic mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of us all? So the question is, how do we explain these, these glitches? There are four explanations that, that uh, are being considered right now. Scientists typically will say the first explanation is we just have bad memories and they're, they're chalking it up to, to a false memory. Number one. Number two, there are physicists that not all, but a contingent of physicists that are saying this demonstrates the parallel universe theory. But what's interesting, Penny, and this has a lot to do with, uh, with what you just shared, all possibilities exist as quantum soup. And when we focus on one, we collapse that possibility into a, that scalar potential into a vector reality. But the thing is, we may not all do it at the same time. So that an individual can pop into a parallel universe that is very, very close to the one that they know, and there are subtle differences. Uh, and to, to that individual, it looks like maybe people, people's beliefs have changed or dispositions have changed or political narratives have changed. So that, that parallel universe is, is the one that physicists are looking at. Uh, there is a contingent of uh, researchers are looking at time travel, that we are coming back from our future shifting timelines to achieve outcomes that are more desirable in our future. Uh, and presumably it has to do with war. The, the war and disease are, are the, two, the two big ones. Uh, and then the last one is one you and I and here our quartet family have talked about. If we are living in a virtual reality, a computer simulation, uh, and as a, as a senior computer systems designer from the Cold War years, I've, I've seen what I'm going to describe, I've seen this happen, where every once in a while you'll reboot the system. Uh, you will implement uh, an upgrade to the operating system, for example. And when you fire up that new system, it's about 99.9% .9 it's the same, but there will be variances and glitches uh, that have not been accounted for in, in the upgrade and they show up as anomalies in, in that system. The evidence strongly suggests over 99% uh, uh, of the algorithms suggest that we are in a virtual reality, that this is not the base reality. So it suggests we may have undergone at least one, possibly a series of upgrades, maybe resets, if you want to call it that. And the one that is dominating this theory is that in the year 2012, uh, the world that we knew at that time actually collapsed. 
and that we shifted into a different timeline. And that's what set into motion the propensity for the wars that we're seeing right now. Uh, and that another timeline reset is the year 2030. And that is the reason there's such a scramble for power and control and everybody is jockeying for position and building their underground bunkers or accumulating wealth, whatever it is, pushing for the fourth industrial revolution, centralize everything before 2030, because if that is a, another reset where we're going to shift those timelines, uh, that is their opportunity to come out in, in a good way. So all of these, uh, each of these four, they, they have things that make sense. They have things that, that uh, we don't know which one is true. But I think the bottom line, we all know something's up. And what I think all of these are showing us is, as Penny said, we are not passive observers. We are living in a participatory universe, as John Wheeler said. And all we have to do is look and see where are our leaders leading us? Are we being led toward more freedom, deeper expression, more expressions of peace, compassion, and love, uh, or is it the opposite of that? And that informs us in terms of how we may be more proactive participating in whatever it is coming between now and the next six years, between 2030. Thank you, Greg and Penny. And I, I think what I'm going to say is going to follow on a bit from Greg, although I, I'll take the moral of your story, Greg, is never throw away your old underwear. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think to get a kind of to get a, a grasp on the Mandela effect, uh, I think we need to look at it's really is a question of what is our view of reality? How do we view the construct of reality? Because if we do perceive reality as being, you know, this physical 3D, then the Mandela effect makes no sense. And we put it down to, you know, a glitch, you know, that phrase is very popular since the Matrix films or psychologists call it false memories. And you say, OK, I've got a false memory. But actually, I think there's something else at, at work, and um, I don't really have a I don't have a mandala effect story myself, but I have a a, a little tale that um, in my youth, for for five years, I lived in a Western Asian country, and I traveled a lot around that country and and, and to Middle Eastern countries, and I, I met what maybe you would call sages. And one of these sages said to me, um, you know, when you're ready, go back to the West, you know, <laughs> go back to your own environment. And he said, and when you're there, read science fiction. So I thought it was interesting because I wasn't a reader of science fiction in those days. So one of the first series of science fiction I read was the Foundation series by Asimov, Isaac Asimov. And I think it's very interesting that series, especially the first three books, the trilogy. Now, Asimov is talking about these, uh, you know, these kind of psycho historians. And the psycho historians are able to see the trends for a long, long, or psycho historians, long, long history in the future. But they can only view that if they, if they can correlate on the trends of a mass humanity. So if a mass humanity stays with the program, they can view more or less the not only the future but the event markers that come in at certain points in that future trajectory however in the second in the second book of asimov there comes an individual like they call him the mutant that has strong psychic powers and when that mutant that person of great psychic ability comes into the historical fold then you got anomalies into the history that you couldn't predict because you had a psychic factor coming into a mass program. So I'm kind of giving a, a very brief synopsis there of Asimov. Um, come to another player, which I think is also important in this field, Philip K. Dick. Now, Philip K. Dick, as, as far back as 1970s, in fact, in a conference in France, called the Metz Conference in 1977, Philip K. Dick said that all his books that he'd written came from his own memory of alternate timelines. 
And Dick was talking about the Matrix, the actual language before, way you know, decades before the films and that. And he said that his own, and he had this cosmology, a very Gnostic cosmology, which I think is interesting. So looking at Dick's view, he said that he understood that they were alternate timelines superimposed onto one another. But certain timelines became the dominant one. But sometimes you'd have residual memory seeping through from a superimposed timeline. And he said that our reality construct was a program, again, using this computer terminology. And he said, what we think of as God is the program. And the programmer could at certain times amend parts of the program, i.e. the story, if it was needed. And within this program, there was what Dick called a dark counterplayer. Again, here comes a polarity, what we may call the dark forces, the evil forces. Dick said this dark counterplayer was in the program because we, the program needed the thesis antithesis, needed these two forces to play off each other for the program to go through. But of course, the dark counterplayer was acting blind to a sense because they they only knew the variables of the program they were in. But the greater programmer knew the, the bigger picture. Um, and so what Dick was saying was that actually the reality that we're in now is he referred to as the intermediary reality. Before that, there was a reality which Dick called the black iron prison because it was deeply tyrannical, deeply constrained, but what happened was that people, as they actually, as they started to wake up, they rebelled against it. And they managed to change enough variables to change the timeline to what we have now, the intermediary one. And Dick said that it's still not perfect because there's still oppressive forces, there's still tyranny, but nothing like the black eye in prison. But if enough people can again wake up to this fact and rebel against it, the variables can be changed. And if we can change the variables, we can get back to what Dick called the, the kind of original program, which he called the garden program. Sounds like the Garden of Eden, where we had this thousand years of peace and everything was, you know, the variables were in favor to our unobtrusive kind of trajectory and progress. So it, looking at that, it makes us realize that actually... Um, there are potential other timelines still superimposed and the residue can still break through or we can still slip through. And the thing that actually is the decisive factor is a psychic factor, similar to what Asimov said. And the psychic factor is what empower us, empowers humanity to adjust the variables because it's a participatory construct. And that's part of the gameplay. Are we able to be awake enough to realize the game rules and change the variables. So if there are forces, let's say, hypothetically, in this construct that don't want us, the people, to change the variables, what do you do? You dumb down and lesser our psychic capacities. So if we don't have a psychic capacities, we can't interact with the variables. Now, those psychic capacities may be interacted with by let's say, energies, electromagnetic energies, the energetic environment. They can also be impacted by the health of the body because the state of our body affects our, our psychic and spiritual capacities. So there's all kind of ways to try to contain the human elements so the variables aren't changed. Because, of course, in this program, as I think Greg pointed out, there are event markers, 2012, 2030, and if humanity can't change the variables before the event marker, the next phase comes into play according to that event marker. So maybe now we are in a stage whereby can we change the variables enough before 2030? And in fact, look, I was looking up in this and there's an interesting figure in computational theory called Konrad Zuse. Konrad Zuse was the German computational um, scientist and even in the 1940s, he was looking at the, the quantum computational model of the universe and seeing it in this way. And um, most, most of his work is in German, so it's hard to get to. But, you know, I think that's a figure to look at. 
But I think the bottom line is to bring it around is to be in agreement with what we've talked about is what we need to do is this program works on if there's enough change to certain degree X factor of variables before a certain juncture event marker comes into being. And I think perhaps if we look at that perspective of our reality construct, it helps us to see more clearly what may be going on in the world around us at this time and in this decade. Kingsley, I think you are so right on. And this is the reason, I, I just finished the conference on this. This is why the transhuman agenda is being pushed so hard between now and 2030, because when we give away our biology in exchange for technology, when we relinquish neurons for computer chips and natural immune response for chemical induced immune response, what we're doing is we are giving away our ability to influence uh, through biological means to, to speak, to communicate with the field. And that is where we have access to those variables. If we really want to make it to another world, you have to take responsibility for that world. If you take your question, you know, we've been herded and all the stuff that Greg and, and Kingsley said, it, you know, there's a program, there's an agenda, and they're working their buns off to try to get us to swallow that agenda and go with it before some date or some timeline. I have seen that date as 2027, not as something that is a lot of people are aware of, but just as this underlying, you know, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. So there's something that is very critical about that period between 2027 and 2030. But I have begun to look at the whole thing as a gigantic paradigm shift. And as the old paradigm comes down and the new one isn't up yet all the way, there's this gap. And we have to navigate that gap. We have to be willing to say, okay, what do I have to do? And when we get to that new paradigm, we're going to be new and different kinds of humans. And the reality is going to be understood to be much more re responsive to us. We're going to say, you know, this is our creation. We did it. We made it, etc. As individuals, we are responsible to deprogram ourselves from what we have been indoctrinated into accepting for at least a generation now that has gotten so extreme. It's so ridiculous. I, I was just watching a news clip uh, of congressional hearings where MDs and PhDs from major universities were telling our Congress people that men are capable of giving birth and menstruation because they are transhuman men. And these kinds of arguments go, they, and arguments like this, they cut right to something really primal and invite people to get locked up and tangled up in these polarizing conversations. This is what divides families, communities, societies and nations. So the deep programming is to rise above that kind of, uh, of conversation to recognize when we feel that primal emotion stirring uh, and we feel the anger, for example, over something. That's exactly what these things are, are designed to do. And if I may add to that um, with another Philip K. Dick uh, analogy, in his science fiction novel, Ubik, the characters were in a kind of uh, coma or trance, and Sun was trying to get information into their world because they were kind of, you know, dumbed down. And so they put messages in their, into their world, they put, which is Ubik, and they try to put uh, instruments and, and slogans to try and say, look, look at this, look at this, trying to get information into these people who were in this kind of comic uh, trance. So in a similar way, what you're saying there is we have to unblock ourselves because there may be information coming in that are trying to kind of nudge us and is going to give us signals and we're, and we're being distorted. So you see, if 
I mean, I, I do feel that there are forces which are trying to give us their narratives, okay? And that's the programming that we need to decondition from. But if if we're not successful in, in uh, accepting their narrative, what's the plan B? What's the next best step? The next best step is to, as you said, Greg, distort us, keep us confused, keep us divided. So we're distracted. So if we're not taking their narratives, we're still not receptive to something else coming in. We're in a kind of our own self a vacuum. And, and so it's not only so we need to decondition ourselves, break from the programming, but also do something to clear our receptivity. So we can get something that's incoming as well. And so we need to look at our, you know, our lifestyles, our emotional, psychological, physical lifestyles, try and keep ourselves as clear as possible. So, you know, and so we can even intuit our own narratives or intuit some information coming in but to keep away the this the noise the dissonance the chaos because that's trying to keep us closed down yeah. well this has been a delightful conversation um uh and what it has highlighted i think is uh, that there is uh, at a very fundamental level a uh, significant degree of uh, uncertainty or things that we don't understand here. And so next time at Quartet, what we're going, our subject is going to be, what don't we know that is really important that we ought to know? And so we can kind of work our way across the horizon in those kinds of terms and say, you know, Don Rumsfeld uh, used to be our Secretary of Defense, had this rather famous quote talking about, you know, there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns and unknown unknowns, you know, and all these kinds of things. And, um, you know, in a, <laughs> in a sense, in a sense, he was really quite right, because we really need to think of a little bit about, uh, in a systematic way, about what we really don't know that would really be important in going forward. And so we'll do that next week. So let me remind all of you in our audience that uh, you're, you're, we're coming to you from Berkeley Springs, our little resort town in West Virginia. And the Arlington Institute produces a whole spectrum of programming things, all pointed out toward the extraordinary times that we're in and how the emergence of a new human in a new world is a, around us and how we can effectively kind of an, both anticipate and prepare for this uh, amazing kind of experience. And so we hope that you'll take a look at us. We're at arlingtoninstitute.org. And we've got all kinds of programs, including transition talks, where every month we feature a speaker from uh, somewhere in the world. And both Greg and Penny will be with us here later in the coming months. And uh, that's always a, always a fun time. Dave Martin will be with us here next month in April. And uh, that's always kind of a full house and very full of uh, uh, very provocative kind of ideas, to say the least. And so I hope you'll uh, take a look at that. So thank you so much, and we'll see you again. Take care. Yeah. Thank, thank you all. Goodbye, everyone. Yep. Stay well. Cheers.